All right, thanks. Thanks everyone for having us. So my name is Brad Rudzeski. I'm a founder of a startup that's called Drone.io. We do continuous integration, deployment, and DevOps tools. We're located here in the Bay Area. Um, I'm really excited to be here, especially knowing the background with Google Web Toolkit. We were huge Gwit programmers over the last year. I think I still have like an HTML5 Nintendo emulator out on the App Store somewhere. So go check it out, uh, but don't you know play with any illegal games or anything like that. Um, <laughs> So hi, I'm Matt Norris. I'm actually a program manager at General Electric. I do software development and architecture. And um, basically, my department uh, dabbles in lots of new technologies, brings new technologies into my business. And I have a background in graphics and animation. And I'm also very, very excited to be here. Um, it's almost as excited as this guy. I don't know if I'm as excited, because I can't jump that high in the air. but. But as Seth said, Dart 1.0 is out, so that's great. It means you've got a stable library to play with. And we're going to actually you know, show you the benefits right now. So Brad's going to go into a demo of a very simple application um, that will go through soup to nuts. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. So, and so I think one of the interesting things, too, just to add on about a Dart 1.0, right? The language is stable. The API is stable. They're working on performance. These are all great things, but a language is more than just the syntax, you know, as Seth said, it's an ecosystem. So if you're gonna be developing in Dart, you wanna know what technologies are available, what tools, what frameworks. And so these are the things we're gonna to go to. And to do that, we wanted to, um, like, like Matt said, build an app, uh, soup to nuts, and go through the code, um, client, server, uh, database. And so I'm just gonna click on this, so we'll jump out. And prepare to be amazed by an awesome URL shortener. So, um, well, pretty much just works as you would expect. Um, you know, I'm going to type in a URL, and I'm going to click shorten, and it's going to shorten it. And then I'm going to click it, and uh, you know, it it goes. And of course, the ironic thing is the shortened URL was actually, I think, longer than <laughs> Google.com. But that's you know, yeah, not a big deal. If that's the worst thing that happens yeah. in the demo, then I think we're doing okay. Yeah, and so you know, just to describe how that we did a, a client side app in Dart. We did the server-side code in Dart, and we're actually persisting, hashing the URLs and persisting those in a Redis key value store, so that when you visit the URL, it's pulling the hash out and, and sending you to the link. All right, so let's jump back in. And I kind of already talked about that, what we'll learn, but client, server-side app, we're gonna talk about testing, we're gonna talk about a little bit about deploying some language features, some tools. Um, a lot of people here from a Java background, so I know you'll care about the tools, things like continuous integration, et cetera. So there's a couple of things. You'll notice that uh, in the, on the client, we're going to start there. And there's actually um, the way that you include Dart into your web application is very similar to, you know, it's very familiar as to how you include JavaScript. So, there's a, a script include. You see the type is actually application Dart. And what allows us to, um, to use this in a, in a browser that's outside of Dartium, which uh, Seth went over in terms of development, is Dart.js. So that's what takes your Dart code, compiles it into JS so that it can be used in any browser. The, to dive into the index itself, each Dart application really starts off as two key files. We've got the HTML file, and then we've got your, your Dart script that's running. And in our particular form, uh, there's the input, where you put your long URL. We've got a button that you click, so that you know, it actually calls Dart from the background. That's where we have you know, the action wired up. And we've got a hidden uh, anchor tag, which that's where we're going to stuff the hashed short URL when we're all said and done. Dart's a little bit different than JavaScript. If you'll notice, each Dart file actually has a main, which um, you know it's not a huge surprise if you've come from you know Java or any other language. It's just the way that the convention that's used. And then just in this particular instance, the only thing we're really doing here is we're wiring up the listener to the button itself on the HTML file. And w really kind of a cool thing, though, is the simplicity in which you can do this. If you're familiar with jQuery, it's, um, you'll feel right at home. Uh, Dart uses a query selector so that you're able to actually you know, grab what you need to and attach the event listener that way. 
All right, so we've wired up the on-click. This is just a quick look at the, the on-click function. Again, if you've coded in JavaScript, this should look extremely familiar. We're creating the HTTP request. Um, we have the on ready state change, so when, when we send the request, we can get a response back. Of course, there's some more complete code. Um, this demo is posted. We just didn't stuff it all into these slides. And then uh, when we get the response back, um, we're going to use that to populate the form calling this uh, show text met method. Um, and then there's one thing I wanted to cover because, you know, as you're going through Dart, you're going to see some new syntax things and some people had some questions. Um, like, what's, what's going on with this thing right here, this underscore? And really, it's just um, the listener is invoking this function on, on callback, and it would typically be passing in event uh, handler data. And uh, we're just going to ignore it. And so that's what we're doing with that underscore. Is we just don't really care about it. And so you'll see that from time to time in, in Dart code and maybe even further in, in this demo. And so as we see these types of things, we'll try to point out um, what they mean. So Seth mentioned this as well. Um, this is some, one of the really cool things that we found about uh, Dart was the syntactic sugar. It takes a lot of the um, you know boilerplate stuff that you're used to kind of putting together and having to piece together in other languages, and and boils it down so that you're not you know you're not using as much, you're not thinking through as much. And string interpolation is a is a great example of this. The thing that I found actually most um, you know, fascinating was the cascades. So Seth also covered that. I'm going to gush a little bit more about this because it's, um, this is where, you know, as, as developers, you're going to spend 90% you know, of your time is spent maintaining stuff, not writing it. And anything that you write is inherently shared with other people. You work on teams. And even yourself, right? You know, a few months later after you write something and go back to it, you might not quite remember exactly what it did. So this is, you know, anything that you can do with a language to make it more readable, make it more like prose, is a great thing. Um, you know, programming is poetry. You're all writers, and this is this makes your jobs easier. It's it's absolutely fantastic, and uh, it really helps in maintaining things, you know, in the future. So for this particular, just to explain what's going on in the code, the, um, the URL short is you know, the, the, the anchor tag that we're actually going to update the attributes when the show text function is, is invoked. And just like in the code that you saw before, we're taking all of the things that we want to change about it. We want to put the new you know, href in there. We want to change its name so that you see what the actual short uh, hashed link is. And we're doing it with Cascade, so it's very, very easy to read and maintain later. All right. So now what I'd like to do is just uh, jump back to the demo. Um, who would have thought we could actually demo more with this? Um, let's go. We're going to go to yahoo.com. And we generate the hash. And boom, we didn't redirect. So what happened? What broke? And so let's jump back into the pitch. And you know we can kind of further analyze what happened here. Well, we didn't type the HTTP. We just typed the www. And it turns out when the server tried to do the redirect um, without the HTTP, uh, it wasn't able to do so. And those are kind of like the mundane details that as developers, sometimes we forget about. And so we thought that was a nice segue into the next topic, which is going to be unit tests. So every time you kind of come across one of these things that might not cro you know, cross your mind earlier when you develop something, every time you know, somebody finds a bug, you want to write that unit test so that you make sure you have coverage going forward. This is starting from the client side. We're going to take a look at how um, you know, to implement this in Dart. The first thing you do is import the unit test library, which is you know, it's baked into, it's thought of from the very first, um, you know, implementation, baked into Dart itself. So it's really great. Um, you also will pull in a HTML enhanced configuration, which this will, I'll show you what the output is in a second. But basically, when you're doing your development workflow in Dartium, it's a, it's a simple command to actually format the results of the unit test and in a nice way in the browser. And finally, the, the meat of this is the test itself. So you know, what we said when you know, somebody came in with a bug report and said, hey, I tried to put in this URL and it, it didn't work, you say, OK, it's because we forgot the protocol. 
We now write a couple of tests to make sure that we have that coverage going forward. We check that it's a, you know, is valid URL, is, is working, and that we get everything, um, you know, stuff the protocol in if people uh, do not include that. And so when you run the, the test itself, this is the output that you get. Um, it shows you that, you know, all your tests have passed. You're green, so you're good to go. Actually, one more thing um, that I wanted to just bring up because Quit came up earlier and we've got a lot of Java developers. Um, I remember one thing I love about this is that I can run my test directly against a real DOM. If you're programming a Quit before, maybe you remember like Ray Ryan's talk on Model View Presenter and you had to actually mock your entire UI. And so um, I think this is awesome that when I write my unit tests against my web page, I can hit an actual real DOM and I don't have to you know, write all that extra boilerplate mocking code. So, so like Brad said, you know, this is fantastic, but there's, and, and it's a really great to see everything kind of included in uh, you know, Dartium and the Dart editor itself. It's a very nice workflow. You don't have to jump to a lot of different places. Everything's contained. But there's going to be points in time when you want to do things. You, know, you want to script them out. You want to do them faster. You're not going to do them you know, manually uh, you know, by control running something. And so that's what brings us into uh, the next topic, which is headless browser testing. And this is really done, um, you know, Dart provides a very nice utility to take care of this. It's a, it's a headless browser with full DOM, like Brad said, and it's faster than running, you know, something like HTTP unit um, and Selenium. So anything that we can do with a browser, we can do in the headless browser. So we use Content Shell, which is the tool itself. And the way that we do this is we call this with an argument of dump render tree. And you'll see that the file that it's pointing to is actually the same you know, that we invoked that you saw on the previous slide with, within the um, browser itself. And when we call that, we see that same content too. You know, all our tests passed, uh, so we're good to go. But it's happening you know, on the command line, so it can be done much quicker and, and built into uh, our build steps later on. So yeah. you mean in terms of like you want to test like yeah. like errors like you expect errors? Yeah, negative tests. So yeah, um, I think. So. Uh, do we have an example of that? In here? I don't think we have. I, I don't think we have an example of it, but it's something that you you could do. It just all depends on how you structure your tests. So yeah, we have um, the things that there's there's more code behind the scenes. It's actually something that we didn't prepare for this particular application. But um, we can definitely add that into the GitHub project and, and show it as an example if that's something that uh, you'd like to see. Yeah, I'm sure there are I mean, plenty of examples, and maybe Seth can answer that one when we're, when we're done. He can talk to that. Because I, I know some of the Dart team there, they're running hundreds of, of these types of tests and analyzing out. So I'm sure they're doing those types of, of tests. But basically, anything you can do from a Dart unit test, you, you're running in, the he in headless mode. So if you're familiar with like a Phantom JS or something like that, it's, it's that for Dart, um, maybe a little more primitive, but hopefully it'll evolve over time. So now I want to talk, you know, the server piece. Um, you know, Seth mentioned Dart has HTTP, TCP, all this stuff built in. Of course, we could talk about the low-level handlers, the request handlers and stuff, but um, I don't program like that. You know, I, that reminds me of like 1999 Java servlets. I typically like to use a web framework. It makes me more productive. I don't have to handle. Um, you know, uh, parsing URL paths and stuff like that. And so we're just going to jump straight to it. This is a framework. Uh, it's called start.dart. It rhymes. Uh, if you're familiar with Express for Node, if you're familiar with Sinatra if for Ruby, um, Rat Pack for Groovy, I think something Spark for Java, there's tons of frameworks like this that, that make it really easy um, to deal with, with URL routing and stuff like that. And so what we're doing here is we're invoking start. Um, what you see is this, this public web. That is, we're, we're pointing it to the server where we're serving our static content out of our CSS files, our Dart script. Um, and then this is where we're, we're declaring that we want to handle this route. So the code where you have the dot, 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 that will get invoked anytime we do a post to that route, which is, of course, important because we're going to be posting um, a URL to this route in order to get back a hash. And so let's kind of quickly look at what we would fill this with. Um, should be pretty straightforward. Um, we're getting the URL from, from the request. 
we're hashing it using a simple SHA hash, right? built into the Dart library. Awesome, Dart has a standard library, it has all this great stuff in it. So I didn't have to write a, a SHA hash, hashing algorithm or anything like that. I was able to just take it right out of the library. And then um, we're using a Redis client. Obviously I don't show how you, you started up here. I didn't think that was necessary, but we're doing something simple. We're setting the hash as the key, the URL is the value. And of course this is asynchronous. And so as Seth mentioned, this is where futures come into play. And so we're saying when this is done, um, we're going to invoke this uh, function here and we're going to say respond uh, with the hash. And so, I mean, Seth kind of touched on it, but it's kind of nice to be able to use this future syntax, uh, especially when you get multiple of these thens, um, you avoid that callback hell. So we really like that as we were programming. And actually, this is a simplified version. We have like an over-engineered like hashing one that uses much more thens in, in the actual GitHub uh, repo. Um, and then this is just, you know, so we've, we've persisted it to, to Redis, we've persisted the hash, and now we need the redirect function. So when someone visit, visits the uh, shortened URL, um, we're gonna look it up just simply with uh, Redis uh, get. We're gonna get the hash, again, this is asynchronous. So we're using a future, we're getting the value, and we're redirecting. Uh, so again, very, very simple, readable uh, code in Dart, we love it. Um, so, so just like we tested the client, um, we're going to test the server as well. And what's great about running the same code on the server and the client is that things are going to feel very familiar. So like we did before, we're going to pull in the unit test library. And we're going to do something a little bit different because we're not going to be testing you know, the HTML. We're actually going to use the virtual machine in this instance. And to test that the, um, you know, the hash is working properly, we first check to see that it's just returning something. We just want to make sure that it's not null. And then we know what the specific hash will be. Um, it's a simple hash, so we're going to test for that specific um, hash. And to run it, all you do is uh, in the command line dart, whatever your uh, you know, test file's name is, and you can see you know, whether it passes or fails. And, and in this case, you know, it passes. All right, so Seth touched on this, so we won't really, we don't have a lot to say about it because it's so simple deployment. Um, Heroku, it's a great option. Um, this is literally what it took for us to get this running on Heroku. Heroku create, uh, Seth mentioned the second command. Um, we give it a URL to what they call a build pack, which is essentially instructions to create a virtual machine on the fly. Very simple. Um, Heroku add-ons, we add a Redis uh, data store. And uh, you know, within seconds we had a Redis database and then we just get push. And so um, it's a great way if you're just getting started with Dart and you're building a cool app and you want to show it to people, um, definitely try out uh, Heroku. And uh, if you Google the Dart uh, build pack, there's instructions for uh, a little more in depth for getting this all working. All right. So um, just a question to everybody. Does anybody know about how many, you know, browser and OS combinations there are out there? <laughs> a million, that's, that's, I think that's pretty close. What, what, another so guess here? Linux is one or many? <laughs> well, let's, go with, let's go with many, many. Let's do, as many permutations as possible. So uh, there, versions? what's that? That includes different versions. It includes different versions too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lots. So, so you, you see this as quickly, you know, spiraling out of control. There's at least over 200 different combinations of, I'll, I'll say the modern ones, so not, not every single one. Um, I was just trying to get as many, you know, uh, numbers as I could, but. <laughs> okay, let's say 2002, right? Or 2004 when like a Web 2 uh, was available, stopped off to be available, right? Yeah, yeah. At, at, yeah, there's some cutoff date. So, but at, but for the modern ones, let's say that it's it's over 200 about uh, approximately the different combinations. And so when we're when we're creating you know web applications, are all of us going out and testing all those combinations you know ourselves <coughs> manually? Probably not. Um, so that brings us to our next segment, which is cross-browser testing. Um, a, Selenium, probably everybody's pretty familiar with. You know, Selenium IDE, you can record tests within your browser. Um, Selenium server, you run those tests. 
we're actually, uh, you know, Dart's got capabilities where you can actually do the scripting for the test within Dart. So again, you're keeping all of your uh, code in, in one place and using the same language. And um, here it's, we're, we just picked out one sample, but basically we're creating the web driver here in Selenium. And we're saying, I want to test on an Android browser. Picture multiple iterations of this. You know, you've got Firefox, um, Chrome, et cetera, everything that you, could, that you could stuff in, you know, add as many as you need to. Um, and then the actual, so that's, that's setting up. The actual test itself is, um, you know, what we're doing is we're basically, you know, finding, again, you know, we're finding an element. We're doing something to that element. And what's, what's neat is we're actually uh, back to the future syntax that we saw earlier. So, again, if we're, this is a simplified version, but we're basically nesting, a whole, you know, we're able to um, stagger a whole lot of asynchronous calls to actually achieve um, the, the testing that we want. And right in the middle of everything, and smack dab in the middle of everything, we can actually you know, throw in an expectation. So that's, that's your test right there. So you, you, can, you can have multiple ones of these chained off of each other. And um, it's, just a, it's just a nice way to actually, you know, again, format this, put it in a very readable format, and, and execute a lot of different, uh, different tests and a lot of different expectations. So yeah, Selenium uh, directly in Dart is awesome. So, um, and you know, as Matt mentioned, there's 200 plus combinations, and maybe some of you guys have seen this. Uh, it's called Sauce Labs. I think it's actually by a bunch of ex Google guys that ran their their internal testing. But it's a web service that works with Selenium that lets you test uh, like tons of different uh, permutations. So once you have the Selenium code working locally, you just point it directly at the Sauce Lab servers, and in parallel, they're gonna test against a bunch of different browsers. And so we actually took the tests, oh, oh I have it here, um, and we ran it against uh, Firefox. And what's pretty cool is when you're running it in Sauce Labs, they actually will record your, your entire set, run your test, show you the output, um, any types of error messages, and uh, it's really a boring video. It's just showing <laughs> what we showed you like two times already. But you can see it's running. It's running with the Dart uh, library, um, and it's running on the Sauce Labs, uh, you know, engine. And so this is something that you can start using today to test in all these different uh, permutations and, and scenarios. The other thing I wanted to show, just because it was so easy, um, I decided I wanted to test our app in Android, right? Why not? I just had to change like literally one, one parameter and in Sauce I'm, I'm testing it in Android. And this actually ended up being pretty fascinating and it kind of goes to Seth's um, earlier point is that we should be testing everything on mobile and using the viewport. And I think this will become very clear when I show you what we found when we ran this on Android. So we're running it on Android and I'm not gonna show the video, I'll just show some of the screenshots. Um, we instruct Selenium to click on the field and add the text. And what does it immediately do? It zooms in all big and I can't see any of the page now. I can't even see the button. Um, and Selenium is able to actually put in the, the URL. So that was scripted correctly. But then we tell uh, Selenium to click the button and Selenium fails. Selenium says we can't uh, fix it, because let me read this. The, this web element is not visible and may not be clicked. And so that's actually kind of awesome because when I normally when I'm using a tool like Selenium, I'm thinking it's gonna find bugs like glitches in code, but this actually kind of found like a UX error. Um, so again, just kind of a nice uh, byproduct of this is being able to test on mobile, see how your app looks. So maybe you have Android, but you don't have iPhone, or you have iPhone, but you don't have an iPad. This does all these permutations. It's free for open source projects um, and uh, there are paid plans and it's probably cheaper than hosting all the infrastructure uh, yourself. So definitely highly recommended. I think we had a question oh. uh, out in the audience. Uh, yes. I was just curious, with Sauce Labs, I saw I was testing localhost. Yes. Which part of the, the test for Sauce like, tells, you, tells it how to run the server? So the way Sauce Labs works is it actually is like a bundled version of Selenium that proxies. So what happens is you're actually almost exactly like what you were showing with the dev tools. I'm running the app locally, and Sauce Labs is providing a local server that's proxying all the traffic to their servers in their environments. So very similar to what you demoed. Was there another question? 
Okay. I think we're jumping back into the pitch. So the kind of last technology we want to touch on was continuous integration. Um, obviously, we've built our app. We're running our tests. Um, it'd be great to do that automatically, especially in a team setting. Um, you know, if we have multiple collaborators, etc. And so um, back in October of 2011, uh, when Dart launched, um, my company, Drone.io, started uh, supporting Dart as a language for continuous integration. And so a lot of the Dart projects are doing continuous integration on Drone.io. Uh, it supports other languages as well. So that's what I wanted to show uh, to you today. So we're going to go ahead and click on, no, maybe not. So I actually have it up right here. So this is um, Drone.io, and yeah, all right, it's showing up. Um, it's a continuous integration server. If you're familiar with Jenkins, similar type of concept. Um, some interesting things with Drone.io, it's completely hosted like Sauce Labs. You don't have to set it up yourself. You don't have to manage your own servers. You can just log into the website and set up an account. Um, but that's actually not what I'm showing you today. I'm actually showing you the open source version of Drone.io. So this is actually something you'll be able to download and run uh, on your own servers. Um, you know, if, if you're running Jenkins today, this, this would be an alternate um, solution. So we actually haven't showed this yet, and it's not scheduled to come out next week, but I was really excited to show it, and I've been like waiting to show this uh, to people. So um, bear with me, because it's not quite production ready yet, so fingers crossed to the, the demo gods that Seth was praying to earlier. Um, so we're going to go in and we're going to set up our repository uh, from GitHub. So I'm just going to go ahead and type that in. I think that's what it was called. All right, so just that simple, we added the project. It actually linked it to GitHub. It added a key. It set up uh, hooks that will automatically uh, trigger a build every time a developer pushes a code change. So. Um, very simple to get up and running with, with CI, especially if you're kind of used to downloading, installing Jenkins, installing software, all that kind of stuff. But so let me just kind of jump back into the, the pitch because I think the one thing we want to show is how do we set up a build? Is you know, so how do we instruct it our build commands? How do we tell it to, to compile or run our, run our Dart code, run our Dart tests? And we do that with a, a simple YAML configuration file that you'll check into the root of your repository. Um, and this has uh, some benefits in the sense that you can build branches differently. Um, so what does this YAML file do? Uh, it sits in the root of your repository. The first thing we're saying is the image. We want to use a Dart image. Um, the cool thing about Drone is it runs all your builds inside a virtual machine, and it downloads those virtual machines from a centralized repository um, using a technology called Docker. So you actually don't ever have to uh, install your own software, or configure your own build environments. We have pre-built virtual machines. So Dart, um, Java for, for the Java developers out there, I think 14 different languages and multiple versions. Uh, the second piece is we're just instructing it, uh, what are the build commands we want it to run? Um, and then we could optionally even deploy to Heroku at the end of the build automatically uh, to get that continuous delivery flow going. And so let's see, how do we want to do this? Just to jump back in and show you how this would work, this is my GitHub repository. And we're going to make a change to this file to just trigger a build in real time. It should email me. That's my email address. So feel free to send me a note if you ever want to say hi. And we're going to make the change. And we're notified via WebSocket, new build running. I'm going to go ahead and click that. And then we can actually see the build output uh, streaming live in real time. So it's going to run our build test. Um, so this is a technology that is available today online for if you're developing open source projects, open source start, feel free to use this to automate your unit tests, to automate your deployments. And if you're interested, um, when we have this available next week, um, definitely check it out as the open source project. And just a comment on the on the benefit of you know continuous integration. It's really great to have a tool like Drone where you don't have to think about running things all the time. Um, you know, it, 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 essentially, you just want to be, you know, as lazy as possible. You don't want to, 
um, worry about having to run your any any tests. You don't want to have to worry about certain checks. You want as a developer, you want to do cool stuff. You don't want to be bogged down in the boilerplate. And getting on board with um, you know automated testing, automated builds, automated deployment is really really going to help you out. And you can just you know discover new things, which is what we what we like to do. So. So just to recap, um, you know, what have we learned today? We we built an entire Dart application. So client and server, we saw that the that you know the same codes used on both client and server. We persisted something to a database. So we went round trip. Uh, we tested things with various testing tools. We saw you know um, whether it's through HTML or um, the command line, and we actually deployed it. So we deployed something, and it was live. It's out in the world there. And um, as we were doing so, we touched on a, couple, a few of the language features, you know, of Dart, and um, you know, some some additional tools that can help you with your workflow. Again, wrapping up with that continuous integration and really um, showing how you know that could really ease uh, your workflow as a developer. So you know, I think in conclusion, right? Dart is awesome. Dart has an awesome ecosystem, and it's still a very young language. And you know, hopefully, some of these tools. Um, you know, if you're coming from a different background, job or whatever, you'll you'll feel a little more at home, and you'll they'll help you be a little more productive. So, what should you do? Try Dart, test things, use tools, uh, and deploy. So, thank you, everyone, and we'd love to take some questions. Yeah. So, the, with the tool you demonstrated. Um, Yep. Um, was that a new tool that is now here, right? Yes. So what is it, when the battle might it be out and what is it who does it serve exactly? Yeah, so the the, the website drone.io, that is live. It's been live for a year and, and it's like a think of it as like a hosted Jenkins for, for anyone to use. Um, but what I demoed is the open source edition that you can download, install, and run directly on your own servers. And you should see that like literally any time in the next couple days. I was hoping it'd be ready for today, but you know how things go. So, and it, it's targeted people that want to use Jenkins. Maybe you, you want to do CI, but you want it on your own servers. And that's called what? It's called Drone. Oh, Drone.io is, is the website. And so, yeah, sometime next week, so we'll, we'll be announcing it. So we usually announce that stuff on Twitter or whatever. So if it's something you're interested in, find us on Twitter and we'll, as we're making announcements. Um, and we're also actually giving a talk related to it, um, Dart plus um, Docker virtualization and drone on Thursday at Rackspace in downtown San Francisco. So if you're in that area, you should definitely come to that talk as well. I think Seth will be there, but not speaking. But you can probably ask him questions that you didn't get to ask here, there, uh, if you want. No, no pressure, Seth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> any, any other questions? Yes. I mean, I think that that's probably a question for Seth's expertise. I'm going to say Dart is awesome and has no memory issues, <laughs> but I'm going to let Seth reinforce that fact. No, no, we, we don't have memory leaks, so that was easy to answer. Um, <laughs> no, I, one, one distinction, of course, I, I don't know what libraries you're using, et cetera, but one thing that we take very seriously on the Dart project is toolability. And so um, we've been working on uh, this project called Observatory, which is actually a Polymer app you connect directly to the virtual machine and you get to inspect it in real time and we're adding more and more things to it things like what are my isolates doing right now <clears throat> what's a heat profile going on right now what's a cpu profile going on right now so uh... you know i don't i don't know and we every time people have bugs but uh... we hope to give you the tools to go in and find the problem and fix the problem All right. any other questions or any others for seth before he sits back down Right, well, thank you again. All right, thanks everyone. <laughs>